All right. So, hi everyone. Welcome to the first fall history talk. Although, as we were talking a little earlier, it does not at the moment feel like fall. <laughs> um, but we at the Santa Clarita Library are thrilled as um, always to have the history talks um, crew here in any and all configurations of the speakers. So um, we just want to say thank you again to everybody and for to Zena for um, just forwarding all of our requests. So thrilled as always, can't wait to hear this. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our moderator, Erin. Hey, everyone. I am um, a friend of the History Talks group. I am a blogger, history uh, historical fiction is my specialty, and I am blessed to know all of these wonderful authors. And I'd like to start by asking each of them to introduce themselves and uh, ask if they could tell us a little bit about the periods that, that they write in. Anne, would you like to start? I guess, yeah, that's what happens when you're at the beginning of the alphabet. <laughs> anyway, hi, I'm Anne Louise Bannon. I know it says Anne Bannon, but uh, it's Anne Louise Bannon, and uh, I write the I write three I write mostly murder mysteries, but they are set in historical periods. The first is the old Los Angeles series, set in the 1870s in Los Angeles. Uh, the second is the Freddie and Kathy 1920s series, set in the 1920s, and finally, it's not. I don't think it's historical because I actually wrote it in the 80, 1980s, but it's set in the 1980s, and that's the Operation Quickline series. And like I said, don't really like calling it historical, but I guess it is. So um, anyway, by the way, check your chat screens. Uh, we've got wonderful uh, links to our other authors. And gee, Andrew, I think you're next in line. This Andrew, me. Well, what other Andrew do we have? Uh, I see a group of distaff people, but I seem to be the only male author at the moment, so it must be me. Well, a little bit about myself uh, and what I write. Uh, I was born at home because I wanted to be near my mother when it happened. I was born <laughs> with a silver pen in my hand. And once my fingers hit the keys, I can't stop them. I don't know what the characters are going to say until they tell me. My most recent book is Katie's Ladies, uh, Women's Suffrage. And I write in the late 1800, early 1900 period. I, I think uh, Colleen is next. Hi, everybody. Um, well, let's see. I write fiction and nonfiction and magazine articles and everything else. Uh, and in all different periods, uh, my first three books were nonfiction and work for hire. And one was a hundred year history beginning in the 1880s and into the 1980s. And uh, let's see, the second one was a pioneer history in Park City, Utah. And the third one was a work for hire for Globe Pequot. And it was a travel guidebook because I also do travel writing. And then the fourth one is um, The Shadow of War, which is back here on the desk. And uh, that's a historical novel set in 1915 and 16. And the new one is California, uh, fascinating stories, uh, true stories from California's past. And it's, it goes from about the mid 1800s to the early 1900s. So that's my and, I'll, oh, and I'm a former historian, research historian for the Cal State University system and had lots of really neat projects and all of them were historical. So. <laughs> is it me? Yep. Yay. Okay. Um, my name is Zena Marie Yule. Sometimes I have to tell, uh, you know, sound it out for people because they are confused <laughs> when they see my name. Um, but I'm a writer of uh, uh, fiction and nonfiction both, but lately I've um, mainly been concentrating on just the fiction. And I'm kind of a, a restless writer in that I like to write in um, different lengths, like short story, novella, and then novels, and then different genres too, mainly um, fantasy and historical romance and adventure. 
So um, today I'm, I'm going to talk about um, the uh, Antarctic historical romances that take place around 1900. And then also my, my latest book is uh, kind of a, a wacky historical uh, romance um, that takes place in the Old West, of course. <laughs> Lady Law and the Texas D Rangers. So um, that's, that's it for me, I guess. <laughs> right. Okay, my first question, and I just kind of want to throw this out to whoever wants to pick it up. Um, we talk a lot about story. We talk a lot about characters. Why are details like travel important to a story? Oh. <sighs> and. <laughs> You're raising your hand. <laughs> yes, I couldn't help it. I had to, I had to, I had to, because in, now, I don't think any of you other guys write murder mystery. There is something, one thing that's really unique about writing the murder mystery is that the everyday details are absolutely critical. Why? It's not just bringing you into the story, although that is very, very important. The other thing that's really important is that's where you hide the clues. It's those little deviations from what is normal that helps us see who done it. And I love who done it. That's that's my favorite. You know, I don't write thriller. I write who done it. And so, to you know, like in my book, uh, I, I've got the the third in the um, old Los Angeles series, uh, Death of the Chinese Field Hands, coming out end of uh, September on September twenty fifth. And yeah, it's a little detail like a bull, uh, uh, a uh, a boot print and a small little watch fob. Why are those important? Well, you have to know those details. You have to understand. How, and, and in this case, transportation did have something to do with it. And how, what tended to happen to people who went around the Cape, the the Cape of is it, Colleen. I'm blanking. Is it the Cape of Good Hope or Cape Horn? Cape Horn. Horn. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Bonus point to Colleen. <laughs> <laughs> but it is absolutely critical to have those little details in a murder mystery specifically. Um, but in general, yeah, it's those little details, understanding how people got around, how people did whatever, that bring you into the story, that make it come alive. Zena, I know you write more romantic stories. Is that true in that genre as well? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I really think that, that the details, um, they signal to us that, that we're in a different world now. I mean, it's not, um, you know, we can just get in our car and drive, you know, an hour to work, 50 miles or whatever. We don't think about it. We can get in an airplane and go all the way to the other side of the country uh, in a few hours. And you know, in the past, which uh, we're writing about, that what obviously wasn't the case in travel was so much uh, more, uh, you know, slow and laborious and dangerous, uh, and just wasn't done as much as as we do it you know, right now. So um, I think that really brings readers into another world, you know, the world of the past, those, those kind of details and having the, the characters have to struggle um, with their limitations. There's another component to travel that uh, I once read about, and there's a parallel you can draw between scientific discovery and how fast man travels on earth from crawling to walking to running to riding horses to vehicles mm -hmm. and so forth and let's hope that we're, we're into rocketry let's hope that uh, does a little bit of good stuff for finding a vaccine amen what about you colleen you you have characters take very very big journeys it's it's not a minor detail for your story Perfect. how has travel affected you well i mean the the novel that i wrote um was about a half of it is on the Lusitania. And um, I mean, how else would you get from New York to London or France or whatever? And uh, so that was a big part of the story. And that took place during the time that um, people didn't take cruises per se, like we do now, just for the experience of it. And yet the experience of it 
was so competitive between all the countries that they, well, for instance, an Italian liner was set up like Pompeii and they had a swimming pool with columns and sand and the, the paintings on the wall like you see in Pompeii and uh, the French had a, a massive one that was, um, they were called palaces, like floating palaces. Yeah. But still, it was all about getting from point A to point B. And as there was so much competition in the beauty of these things with the gold gilt and everything else, then the next step was to get it to go faster and faster and faster. And that's where the big competition came in. Even though you were on these beautiful ships, you still wanted to get there in five days, you know. So, yeah, I mean, and, and then um, I think everything back then um, that I've been writing about it is about getting to California or getting uh, via wagon across the country and so those are really big stories and such a huge part of our country's history. I kind of love what you guys are saying about how there's this kind of human experience it can pull somebody in from our modern day and, and give them something to grasp on that's really really interesting. Um, all of you have researched different periods. What modes of travel did you specifically research for your works? Let's, let's start with Zeno. Let's start with Zeno. Um, well, the, uh, for my Old West um, uh, romance, it's, you know, horseback riding and stagecoach uh, riding, which I grew up in Arizona and, and I've ridden on a stagecoach, not you know, to actually go anywhere, but just to try it. And it's terribly uncomfortable. They didn't have, I mean, you're like jolting around. They didn't have shock absorbers or anything. It, I mean, I can't imagine going any real distance uh, it, it, like that. I mean, they must have just been, they're, they're another breed <laughs> from what I am. Um, but in my uh, Antarctic um, romances, I, I definitely did a lot of um, research about dog sledding uh, because, you know, what are you going to do when you're out in the frozen wastes? You have to, you know, find a way to get around. And there are, um, well, there was uh, somebody mentioned a race and there was a race to the, um, to the South Pole by um, Roald Amundsen and from Norway and um, Robert Falcon Scott from um, Britain. And so they were trying to see who could get the glory of, you know, discovering or getting to the South Pole first. And uh, Roald Amundsen uh, happened to win, uh, but he also brought with him, um, you know, uh, skis and dogs for dog sledding. Whereas uh, Robert Falcon Scott, uh, he didn't want much to do with the dogs. He uh, brought Manchurian ponies from, I guess, from around Siberia with the thought that they would be uh, more hardy and some mechanical um, devices or mechanical, um, you know, early mechanical uh, transportation and those you know promptly froze up and <laughs> didn't work and then the Manchurian ponies had to be um, shot because they just were well they were weakening and dying anyhow so um, so Robert Falcon Scott unfortunately he he and his team never made it home uh, they perished in Antarctica so really a, a lot um, the transportation was critical in their um, experience. So my, uh, my Antarctic stories um, have as a plot point, um, they're setting up for these later expeditions like uh, Scott and Amundsen. And so that's where that all comes in. <laughs> in Katie's Ladies, a well-to-do woman by the name of Lucy Burns, who was a suffragette, was taking a commuter train from Boston to, to New York she found a newspaper article on the, in New York about a fascinating immigrant woman from Pittsburgh, the Pittsburgh area. So when she got to New York, she switched to her car, which she kept garaged in New York. And she had a mechanic there who would get it ready for her. And she drove from New York to the Pittsburgh area. Now, the significance of that was she drove across the, what had been just fairly recently 
uh, created as and called the Lincoln Highway. It's Route 30 today, goes from coast to coast. But at that time, uh, we talked about some of the dangers and going through the water and the bad guys that would wait in and wait for somebody to break down so they could do some harm to them and so forth. So not only is the vehicle important in transportation, but so is the dirt, I guess, that they're running over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in fact, uh, since I write both in the 1920s and in the 1870s, lots of different modes of transportation, and we kind of forget there was one that pretty much every human being did prior to the car, and that was walk, the human foot. I mean, vast majority of people walked. Horses were still expensive. I, you know, a lot of cowboys had them because that was part of their job, but it was probably they were owned by the ranch hand. I mean, by the ranch owner, some of them were, and some of them weren't. Um, so there was the human foot. There's the ho typical horse and uh, cattle driven things, such as oxen, who, you know, one yoke of oxen, an old yellow dog, the old Shanghai rooster, and one spotted huh? That's, you know, Betsy from Pike. If, I don't know if you guys remember that. So. Um, but they crossed the wide prairie because with a yoke of oxen, because horses were skittish. Um, there are all sorts of stories in the LA newspapers uh, in the 1870s. Yeah, we had another runaway this week. <laughs> and yeah, they, they would run off. Um, the fun thing about the 1920s, though, is not only do you have cars, you have airplanes. And my character, since one of my characters is a millionaire, pretty little, it has, he's one of the New York's fame, 400. He, he's very, very wealthy. And he has, and I did a lot of research on this, a, Curtis, a custom Curtis biplane that he loves. He loves to get out. And in the second book in the series, which is Bring Into Bondage, the first book is fascinating, or the, the second one is uh, Bring Into Bondage. He literally takes his then friend, yeah, we know that, <laughs> girlfriend, Kathy Briscoe, to her parents' farm in Kansas in the length of one day, which is like freaking unheard of from New York, in a biplane. And Kathy's like, I don't like this. <laughs> you know, because, you know, as she says, what good is it going to do me to get to my parents, if I don't get to my parents' place because I'm mangled in a haystack in Ohio? <laughs> you know? And what about you, Colleen? Go ahead. Well, uh, the uh, course with the ships and so forth, um, that was kind of my theme. And But doing the new book that I'm working on, there was a lot of um, ship travel, but in the 1850s, of course, is when they started using the side paddle wheelers and that kind of thing, along with the sails. But um, I, there were only three ways to get to California. Like Anne said, you know, you're going to do the oxen with your wagon and take your chances. And that was the cheapest way to go. But it was also months long and extremely dangerous, as we all know. And then the other way people were coming, well, they would come from Europe over to, say, Nova Scotia or into New York Harbor, you know, along the East Coast, then catch another boat down to uh, some, they would stop along the route and switch, um, switch ships to different places because they had to coal up or if they were wood burning engines, they would have to take on more water and wood. And then some of them would get off in a Chagres, I believe is how you pronounce it, right at the mouth of the Chagres River in Panama. And then they would stay there. And I guess it was really, really iffy. Uh, and then you'd stay at, at this hotel, which was basically tents. And then you would board dugout canoes. Now picture this, you're, you're a woman going to California with your kids to join your husband who has been there mining, okay? And you and the kids climb in, the Indians or these little canoes, and they take you up river and you stop along the way. And then those places were mosquito ridden and awful. And then if you were still alive then, and you had the money, then you'd get on a, a mule or you'd walk and go the rest of the way to Panama City. And then I was reading um, about this one family, she had four children 
and they wait, waited seven weeks to get a ship to take them to California from the Panama Canal because the ships, they would go up there and then the crew would desert and run off to the mining, to the field, <laughs> get rich, right? Why would you come back down on the ship? So they had to Shanghai people and get them back down. And it was really difficult. And then the other way, of course, was around the horn. And I read some stories or some diaries about the women would get so seasick, they somehow lashed sawhorses that rocked to the deck because they, that way the women could visualize that they were on a horse or something. And they would, it was a, a cure for seasickness, supposedly. Wow. And those ships caught on fire constantly. And this one woman and her children, they had, it took them four different ships and they all caught fire and sank. And, you know, they would be rescued and then get on another one and go a little further and it sank. And it took them two months to get to San Francisco. So those were your ways of, of you know, coming across the United States at that point. <laughs> oh, uh, there's also Stagecoach. Uh, Mark Twain, oddly enough, I forget, gosh, I can't remember the name of the book, but one of his early autobiographies talks about roughing him and his it? What? Roughing it? Was yeah. Roughing it. Thank you, Zena. Uh, it was, uh, and I remember uh, we were having family reading time and we were reading Roughing It. And he talks about riding in a stagecoach in the 1850s across the United States in a stagecoach that you went in stages. Every two hours you had to stop and change horses because horses can only run full out for two hours. And so that's why, you know, and his description of that trip is just like, oh, my <laughs> I know as a as a casual reader I find details in the, the strangest of places and this kind of leads into my next question is where are you guys sourcing information for travel I mean this is not something that's easily sourceable well I I can um answer that first I guess um for uh old west it's you know it's there's a lot of diaries, there's a lot of books. Um, growing up in Arizona, I, I lived in a mining town and you know it was just all around. Uh, but for Antarctica, there is uh, surprisingly a, a lot of information online from different countries that have bases, um, that currently have bases in Antarctica. Um, Australia has some good information. Um, so does, uh, uh, other, you know, the U.S., of course, uh, Norway, different different places, but they have like old uh, logs. They have uh, bills of uh, lading of like you know what what was purchased to go down there. Mm -hmm. They have they made like little uh, newspapers because it was terribly boring uh, for a long time in some of these remote places. And so they would make like funny little newspapers and put on little, you know, plays. Uh, the men would do that. So there was a lot of, um, and then pictures also uh, really can help uh, a lot to, um, you know, get the real feel of the place and the hazards that, that the people had to um, overcome. And most of us aren't really very familiar with you know, what living in nothing but ice is like. And um, it can be like huge giant blocks uh, that you have to like climb over, or ride your little sled dog over, or lift your sled over. <laughs> so there's, uh, there's a lot of um, great uh, information, and of course, um, in books too, you know. Diaries are great. Ancestry.com, if you got nothing to do one afternoon, you want to do a little research, do some mining on Ancestry.com, you find some fascinating stuff. One of the things I learned is that I had one of my characters do, he was an 18 year old who came from Europe, he spoke only German and Bosnian, and he got landed at uh, Baltimore, and he decided he's going to walk west. So he started walking and a guy stopped him, he had a little kiosk and got out of the kiosk. Well, the man who had come from Europe, entered the country illegally so he didn't have papers he assumed he was being asked for papers so he ran away <laughs> later he found a, a guy in a wagon who picked him up the guy in the wagon happened to be 
from Eastern Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Dutch. So they kind of were able to communicate. And they, they got to the guy in the kiosk and he thought, oh my God, I'm going to get arrested now. It turned out that it was a toll road. So the guy driving the wagon had to pay the toll. But it, it, the toll road was not only for vehicles, but if you were walking up that road, you had to pay the toll also. So when he thought back, the guy in the kiosk talking in a language he didn't understand, wasn't asking him for papers. He was asking for payment to walk up the toll road. It seems like uh, it seems like we all use a lot of primary sources, which is mm -hmm. ideal, especially with Anne having access to some historical records for Los Angeles. That helps. But I mean, I think um, newspapers are going back there to mm -hmm. newspapers to your time period, um, trying to find diaries, visiting historical societies, and I, I'm a very keen on going to the places I'm writing about and interviewing people. And uh, I was going to add one thing about transportation on trains. And that was an interview I did um, quite a few years ago with a woman who was almost 100 years old at that point. And she had actually lived in a sod house on the prairie. And when she came west, the trains, of course, were in by then. And she brought her children. And she talked to me about the difficulties of train travel back then. Uh, if they opened the windows, because they didn't have air conditioning, of course, so they'd open the windows for air, but then those big smokestacks were belching out all that black smoke, and it had bits of, of burned this and that in it, and it would catch the diapers that she had scrubbed out in the little wash basin, and she'd hang them out there to dryers, and then they would get little burns all over them and everything. <laughs> It was it was absolutely amazing. So I'd like to. I actually wrote up an article about that. But those are the kind of details that we historical writers love to include in our books. And more than one time, those cinders that came out of the smokestacks landed in the men's beards and caught the beards on fire. Oh. There you go. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I mean it, it. It it's it's amazing, and and as Colleen says, I yeah, I'm a big primary documents kind of girl, and I love going to the old newspapers and, you know, even city council minutes, uh, all the arguments they had over, okay, is the train coming to L.A. or not? Uh, where is it going to go? And um. We had initially, Michael and I had initially thought that the train uh, from Wilmington down near San Pedro to what we now know as downtown LA didn't really happen until later. And then we found out uh, also, by the way, our public libraries are full of this kind of stuff. Uh, I mean, I, and I, Margaret, Morgan, I really do have to salute you on this one because this is hey, when the history librarians at Los Angeles Public Library know you by first name, <laughs> you know, you're doing your research. And so, uh, you know, they come up with all sorts of great stuff. And so I, I, you know, libraries are a really terrific resource for this sort of thing. It, 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 you know, and I know Morgan put it in the chat. Hey, we have some of this stuff. <laughs> well, I, I, for one, just love hearing that you guys are looking at these, these first person accounts. I mean, as a reader, myself, as a reviewer, um, these personal details, the, the things about, you know, a, a piece of ash from a smokestack, those are the things that make stories memorable for readers. And I love that you guys are searching out those kinds of details. And you have to be accurate. Uh, my gal that drove from across Pennsylvania in her Ford motor car picked up Katie in Pittsburgh and drove to Washington, D.C. And when she got to Pittsburgh, she honked her horn. It was something new. And uh, I had to do some research about the particular model car she was driving, and I discovered that the horn wasn't a part of the car until the following year that it was built. So yeah. you've got to be careful about the accuracy. Oh, yeah. oh yeah. very much so. Yeah, um, I, I'm just waiting to get nailed because the weather wasn't that way in 1924 in New York. <laughs> Um, you guys have all researched different periods, different modes of travel. What was the most surprising thing for each of you during the course of your research? 
Yeah, how short or how fast a plane ran out of gas? <laughs> no, I, I seriously, because, you know, as I said, Freddie has this custom biplane, and I'd spent some time with a uh, guy at a history museum in Chino who was telling me about all this stuff. And it really surprised me. You got two hours in the air. I mean, it was kind of like a stagecoach. You were up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. I mean, if you were going to do any distance traveling at all. And, uh, you know, and we all know landings and takeoffs are the worst part of the air travel. So I can just see Kathy going, you know. So. I already told you mine. I was surprised that you had to pay a toll to walk on a toll road. <laughs> right? When I, when I was, uh, I had to give a lecture for a high school and they asked that I, they knew I knew a lot about the Lusitania and they asked if I would compare the Lusitania. It was called the Titanic versus the Lusitania. That's what they gave me to talk about. So I think the most surprising thing was that when the, uh, we all know the story of Titanic, but they did not have drills for using the lifeboats. The crew didn't know how to use the lifeboats, like, you know, un unfurling things and unclipping things and all of that. They had no idea what they were doing. And there were no drills for the um, passengers, like emergency drills. And there were no life jacket drills where they taught them how to put on these. They weren't that complicated, but when you're panicky, Okay, so then what they did after the Titanic went down is they had this big, the naval people had this big meeting and they said, okay, we can never have another ship go out without the proper number of lifeboats. That was the big lesson. And also they were speeding. I mean, they were going way faster than they should have gone in the ice fields, right? So the speed was a big deal. So then we go over to, that was 1912. And then in 1915, we have the Lusitania they had no drills for lifeboats. They had, the crew had no idea. Same thing. The people put on their life jackets so fast, some of them put them on upside down. And then when they jumped overboard or they were washed overboard, they would flip upside down and drown because they didn't have them on properly. So everything else was the same. And the passengers were, were practically crazy, angry, because they felt like they should be having drills and so forth after what happened to the Titanic. But, you know, after that, hopefully some things changed. So that was a very big surprise for me. <laughs> um, I, I found out some really interesting things about dogs. I love dogs <laughs> so do and dog sledding. Um, you know, of course, in the, um, in the Americas, in North America, uh, there were no horses um, until the Spanish came in the 1500s. Um, so the native peoples used dogs a lot for um, as beasts of burden, and so it would be natural that they would, um, you know, hook, hook them up to a sled. And there um, actually are two different kinds of sleds. We are uh, mainly familiar with uh, what's called the gang. Um, you have dogs right in front of each other and you know, the sled behind them. But there's also a kind um, that's called the fan hitch. And it's where um, they're like the, the fingers of a hand come, they come out like this. So the, the um, sled would be kind of like here in the middle and then the dogs would be all fanned out um, anywhere from like 12 to 16 of them. Um, Initially, that just kind of sounds bizarre, <laughs> but uh, it had its um, it had its advantages. Uh, for instance, in a gang line, apparently, um, s some of the dogs can really not pull their own weight. They just kind of run along and not really pull. They just stay in their harness. <laughs> but when it's on um, a fan hitch or a fan configuration, um, each dog is pulling um, its own weight literally. So that's one good thing about it. But one a disadvantage other than, you know, getting tangled and not being able to go through a narrow um, path in the forest, for example, is that um, each dog then has to uh, break its own path through the snow. So they can't just follow a path that's already uh, been beaten down. 
So each kind has its uh, advantages and disadvantages, but um, over time the fan hitch just kind of went out of uh, favor and now we have the uh, gang line. Um, last question, I guess. Um, everybody has researched different kinds of travel and my question is, would you yourself opt to travel the way that your characters do? <laughs> Hell no. <laughs> okay, why? <laughs> well, let's see. Stage goes. <laughs> uh, traveling around Cape Horn. Oops, the ship goes down. <laughs> um, <laughs> choo choos, cinders all over the place. No! <laughs> I don't want to do that. Yeah, the airplane. Those airplanes, my God, they were like held together with spit, spit and bailing wire, almost literally. No! <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, I drove, I'm probably the senior member of the group today, and I could remember in the 50s and 60s, I've crossed the country using the following modes. I've hitchhiked, I've hiked, I've traveled by car, train, bus, and plane, but no way in hell would I want to travel it on a stagecoach. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, those ships were pretty, they were floating palaces, like I said, and other than being sunk, <laughs> they were pretty darn nice. <laughs> so maybe, just not the Lusitania or the Titanic. <laughs> you weren't floating palaces if you were steerage. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> yeah, you have to be first or second class <laughs> otherwise. And yeah. there's getting seasick. Yeah. Well, I would love to dog sled. I have not done it yet. <laughs> Not yet, but I would love to. What, what I have done is I have three dogs. They're like medium size. I have hooked them up to my bicycle and oh. gone on little rides around the neighborhood, which actually it works pretty good if you're very, very careful <laughs> and observant <laughs> because what tends to happen is you're riding down the, the street and some neighbor's dog will see the motion and come running after you and try to attack you <laughs> or something. But it's actually pretty easy to train your dogs to like stay in one uh, spot and, and, you know, stay kind of, kind of weave out when you're going to turn a corner and stuff. So, so I would love to dog sled. It's on my bucket list. <laughs> I guess this, this, I guess I do have one more question. Zena doesn't seem to have this problem, but does anyone else feel guilty for making their characters experience something that they themselves would not sign up for? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> okay. No, actually, keep in mind, in the, the Freddie and Kathy series, I've got two characters. And uh, so while Kathy is not a fan of flying, Freddie loves it. So... I'm not feeling too guilty on that respect. As far as feeling guilty about making Maddie cross the country on a stagecoach, uh, she doesn't like being in LA anyway. So it's just, that's part of who she is. And that's kind of the fun of that particular character is that she has to come to terms with who she is in the place she's landed. Well, we all have to torch characters what where's the drama if everything goes right <laughs> yes. <You know>? Sorry. <laughs> although i am looking forward to uh at some point i am going to send freddie and kathy over to uh uh, uh paris it, 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 and mm -hmm. i it's like a few more books down the line um and that is going to be fun when they come back because kathy's going to be extremely nauseous uh but it won't be because it's just seasickness. Yeah. Uh-oh. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> it's a clue. Okay, I guess I guess with that we we can open it up to any questions. <laughs> I mean <laughs> I'm just loving this comment. Torturing characters is a pastime, isn't it? <laughs> and I, my husband and I were discussing who I was going to be killing in my next work in progress. Well, torturing them is much more, much better than oh my us getting tortured. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'd love to ride horseback across the country. No. I wouldn't mind if I could walk the horse. 
be a very long trip, but I could do it. <laughs> well, this, I haven't written about this, but I, a few years ago, I went to uh, Northern Spain and the Camino de Santiago, Ooh. which ended up being about 350 miles over weeks. And it, it's really, um, really interesting um, walking for that period of time, like all day long. It's like we're made to do that. You know, you get in a rhythm, and, but, but it does tend to really wear your body down when you go day after day after day and you don't take a break. Um, there were people who had what's called a, um, I think they, they called it the Camino Shuffle or something, the way, you know, you, like your, your leg would be all messed up and you'd kind of be, you know, lurching along anyhow. And you could tell when you, when you looked at somebody that, um, that they are really, you know, not taking the time to take care of their body. I do like distance walking, so that's, I, I might, you know, do something a little more extended, but, uh, you know, 5,000 miles, I don't think so. <laughs> uh, distance walking for me is from the kitchen to the wine cellar. <laughs> I'm with you, Andy. Colleen, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, RLS. Rabbit oh, Louis Stevenson. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and somebody says about the comment that horses can only go full out. Well, they, I don't, I don't think they can go full out for two hours. Um, but they, they get pretty worn out. But they can, they can probably go, uh, you know, at a good pace for that amount. They can, of time. Yeah. Uh, from what I understand, I, I. I you know, it's, it's one of those, okay, I need a five minute answer. Okay. Uh, uh, and thought, oh, really? That sounds like fun. I'm sorry, but I, I, I did the whole, how fast do horses run it for how long kind of thing. And they said, uh, and I got three different sites that said three, you know, three hours. So I, I kind of went with that one. And um you know, I, I'm sure they probably weren't going full out, but they were, they were running that, that, you know, you, you could, yes, Colleen. Well, I was uh, just reading, um, I think it's Jan that wrote about stagecoach drivers in the 1800s who traveled, uh, how, apparently quite a wild ride, blah, blah, blah. So has, uh, has anyone, probably you have, Anne, have you all heard of um, Charlie Parkhurst? Hurst? She was actually Charlotte, but the, the woman stagecoach driver, and she apparently held a lot of records, and then they didn't know it was a woman until she died, basically. Yeah. And, um, you know, they taken her clothing off or something. But uh, she was quite the gal, and, and really, really good at what she did. So, yeah, I, I think I have heard of her. I, I, it was, you know, only tangentially. I, would, I, I will have to do some look. It's, it's, you know, the, the thing is, is you're talking about horses that were bred for this. Um, they changed them out very quickly. You know, I mean, you know, it's just, and, and like I said, Mark Twain gives a really good description of it. And, and, and it's, it's in roughing it. And it's, it's, it's a fun read because, you know, it's, it's Twain. <laughs> oh, <laughs> backpacking can be a fun form of historical travel. Yes, that's what I that's what I did when I was on the Camino. But thankfully, they have little um, like little hostels along the way, so you don't have to carry your tent and your, you know, food and your every everything with you. But yeah, um, and, and actually, I think I, I don't they have like courier groups that'll take your luggage from point to point to point. Yeah, if you pay, if you pay. And, yeah. and that can be good because it takes a while. It takes your body a while to get used to carrying that much. Uh, you know, even though you're not carrying a tent, you're still carrying a fair amount of, of weight. You know, your clothing and your your shoes and your toiletries and whatever your books and all that. So right, and carrying so your at ring least at the Mordor. beginning. It can be <laughs> yeah, you ring for Mordor. <laughs> Thank you, Morgan. <laughs> no, that was Rachel Miller who said that. Um, yes. actually, I don't know much about hot air ballooning, but I can imagine it probably was not safe. 
And I think actually, as far as a mode of travel, I suspect it was more about exhibition. That's just my guess. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Wasn't that what um, Phileas Spog did in Around the World in 80 Days? Didn't he do some of it by hot air balloon? Well, yeah, but that's Jules and Verne, who I was not yeah. exactly true. Yeah, that's based. true. He was science fiction. <laughs> first, one of the first science fiction writers, yeah. Well, I think they had air balloons very, pretty early on. I think they used them in the Civil War. Oh, uh, they, did. they did. Yeah. They did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think they even used them a little before that. But I... Yeah, it started in Paris. Oh, I yeah, think. that's They're right. Millie there. Bly... Uh, you're right, Michael. Uh, Ross, I did. I do remember hearing about Nellie Bly doing it. Yes, they were used for observation in the Civil War. Uh, oh, and then there were Zeppelins. Yeah, World War One. Yeah, you bet. Hindenburg. Well, that was later, but yeah, <laughs> they used them. They used to. You have pictures of them, and they're they're these these Zeppelin things, these balloon things, and then. Somebody's leaning out of the the basket, dropping bombs, just like, oh. like that, manually dropping bombs. Wow. In London or, or on a Paris or whatever. Actually, yeah. they did that in the planes at first, too. Yeah. I remember reading somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In World wow. War One, And they didn't really get into the shooting. I wouldn't want to be <laughs> what? I, wouldn't, I would not want to be handling a bomb. <laughs> Well, you know, given how the likelihood of those crates actually staying up in the air. I mean, keep in mind, what was first flight? 1903, and we've got like maybe 15 years later, we've got planes. <laughs> and, you know, 14, 15 years later, you know, they're, they're shooting at each other, you know, trying to coordinate machine gun fire with propeller spin. You know. Wow. Um, yeah, and I did a little bit of research that because my character, Freddie, who, even though we're taking up the story in 1924, one of the reasons Freddie, uh, 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 Freddie ended up spending the war, Great War in the States because of a uh, bit of logic so phenomenal, you had to be part of the U.S. military to appreciate it. He already <laughs> knew how to fly, so they, were, they got him to teach all the totally aces trying to fly. Sure. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. Kind of. Kind of. <laughs> but like I said, a point of logic so phenomenal, you had to be part of the U.S. Army to recognize yeah, it. Another problem with the early biplanes in, in battle in addition to trying to shoot through the propeller and not shoot your propeller off, is if you were going into a dive to attack somebody else, you could actually outrun your bullets and get shot with your own bullet. <laughs> oh, yeah, and they they were like pretty scary, and 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 they and they did not apparently. I heard from somebody else that. Um, uh, when I was doing my research on backhands and that, that they really didn't do loop the loops like you see in Wings or, you know, the, the 1927 film about the flying aces in, in World War I. And, and they weren't doing that. They were doing something called Immelman's, which went, meow, meow, instead of, and really when you think about it, you're doing this, this is asking for trouble. <laughs> And couldn't, what, did they have seat belts at the time, or wouldn't they just fall out if they did that? Um, well, I think they, they, I they may have been. They had seat <laughs> you know, I don't they, know. Maybe they had a little rope you could hang on to. Or centrifugal force. Out, and, force. Out, force. <laughs> and there's always good old centrifugal force. Oh, cool. Yeah. You know, one thing we didn't talk too much about, but it's very important, um, especially in U.S., is train travel and how the railroads, uh, you know, s started in um, in the east and uh, the rail lines and everything were real congested. And but as um, as it traveled west, really difference in um, in shipping freight costs and getting people out to where, uh, you know, people and products out to the west and settlers out there 
when the transcontinental um, railroad went through, that's that's really when like it, the economy speeded up. You know, people were able to to um, settle. There was just all this like industrial activity that really changed the way. Um, you know, really gave America like a firm uh, footing to mm -hmm. to kind of take off into the next you know decades and up through World War II to be this, you know, technological behemoth that we are. But we, and they were, um, they were, at least at first, uh, they were pretty dangerous to, to uh, take, take rail, um, you know, railroads. And they had like different, uh, different gauges in the tracks and stuff. So maybe this train, you know, <laughs> was on this gauge and it didn't, hook up to this one. So there's all these uh, problems that were overcome over the years that we don't think about. And, and we keep in mind, you know, one of the reasons Southern California got a reputation for oranges was the train system. They were finally able to get the product out to the rest of the country. Uh, LA had a major population uh, spurt from 1870 to 1880. I think it was like went from 5,000 people to 10,000. In 1880 to 1890, it was like 100,000 people. Wow. It had just, <laughs> and that's, you know, yeah. the first trans, we got our first link to the Transcontinental Railroad in 1875. So, um, uh, yeah. Admittedly, I, I don't like saying railways were what made Southern California because while California there is a certain amount of truth to that. It's also a little simplistic. You know, if you say any one thing in history created this, that, or the other thing, you, I, I, my personal opinion, it, it tends to be, you know, again, a little too simplistic. It's a little too, you know, not, it, there, there are so many different things. I mean, water had an enormous effect on how LA evolved an enormous effect. Why? Because we don't have that much here. And people need water, you know? Well, so, speaking of water, we didn't quite talk about it very much, but did anybody research river travel or, or shipping on the Great Lakes? Um, I haven't yet. No, not yet? No. Uh, steamboats. On steamboats, okay. Mississippi and so forth, yeah. Yeah, and I think the first one was the New Orleans in 18, what was it, 1811? 1811 from Pittsburgh. From Pittsburgh down, down to New Orleans um, and, the, and the steamboat. But Fulton, of course, uh, had to develop that first and then it caught yeah. on. And it took a long time before they were able to use that same kind of engine this, with the steam uh, to get a boat that would do okay on the sea and not just capsize or something like that. Because they were they were very uh, shallow draft, you know, mm -hmm. off the rivers and so on. So they had to adapt and so forth. So yeah, I mean, it's really interesting because that certainly is what everything was done, <laughs> you know, on the riverboats and so forth. So. Uh, yeah, uh, and I know I'm going to have to research it soon anyway. So Colleen, I'll be calling you. <laughs> <laughs> I have tons of books. So <laughs> yeah. I know that um, that earlier than the steamships, um, there were uh, barges that um, like with the er Erie Canal, um, yeah. Yeah. which uh, was like the first big um, long uh, canal where people could, you know, put their goods on a barge and then they would be towed along, the draft animals would be alongside the, the ship and they would tow them along. And I read that you know, shipping your goods that way was 95% cheaper than the other methods they'd had, like, you know, putting them in a wagon <laughs> because right. there weren't good roads, there weren't anything. So that's kind of interesting, but I don't think that lasted terribly long. Well, keep in mind, being able to get your goods to market from further out is one of the things that developed urban culture. Yes, exactly. You know, you know because, you know, you didn't, in fact, when I was doing Bring Into Bondage, there's a scene where Freddie's eating on, you know, they're at Kathy's parents' farm, and Freddie's eating food, you know, chicken that was clucking a few hours ago, yeah. you know, <laughs> and, and all this, and there's a freshness, and all the food he eats has mm -hmm. been hauled in. You know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's very yeah. different. So it's, it's mm -hmm. but the, be, being able to ship things. Uh, oranges mm -hmm. were relatively uh, fragile. 
and they can be grown in very very few places because That's of true. the temperature issues so one of the things you know so as uh you know i do have one of kathy's brothers who grows oranges in what was my former whole hometown of uh, placentia you know, because that's what they were doing in the 1920s. And I, I've got, I, I was at the Placentia Library a number of years ago, and there's this great, one of those panoramic shots of the orange groves with derricks all over them. Oh, two yeah. industries, oil and oranges. Mm -hmm. and, they, and the shipping really got um, going with the products from California when they developed re uh, refrigeration for the cars. And they would literally have these, these containers on top of the cars and they'd put big ice blocks in them. And then they would go to the next station. And of course they're melted by now. So now we put in more ice blocks at the next station mm -hmm. and so on to get them to market without mm -hmm. rotting. Oh, that's interesting. That was interesting, yeah. Yeah, that's another, I want to know how they did that. You know, it, I think that's half the fun of this, at least for me, I don't know about the rest of you guys, but it's just, you know, you're going along, you're looking at the, Holy crow, they did that. <laughs> it's just so much fun about that. Sure. That's, That's why the research is so wonderful. <laughs> you learn all these. It's called the rabbit hole for a reason, folks. <laughs> <laughs> That's the fun part. <laughs> That's the fun part. <laughs> Down the rabbit hole. <laughs> Down the rabbit hole. Yeah, I'm gonna spend a few hours at the library. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, anyway. I'll add one okay. The, the river travel. I grew up in Pittsburgh on the Monongahela River. Uh -huh. and, and that's a perfect example for river travel. The, the mills along the river started out of the first peat and uh, various components. And by the time they got to Pittsburgh, where the entire steel was was made uh then they could hook up with the other rivers and as somebody mentioned earlier go all the way down to new orleans with the with mm -hmm. their steel or whatever their product was mm -hmm. yeah sorry morgan well this has been fun enjoyed oh it. yeah i was just going to say that was a big pause right about near the end so but mm -hmm. if there was more to say then there was more to say so thank you andrew um, in the meantime, I'll go ahead and just thank everyone and close out. And um, if there's any other questions, go ahead and put them in the chat real quick. But um, thank you again to the Historical Novel Society. We're just so, so thrilled that I ran into you at that booth all those months ago. It's been such a boon to the library to have all of you. Oh, so we love being you. here. It's been yeah. fun. Yeah. So um, with that, for future his talks, everyone, we've moved them to the third Monday because there were um, several members of the community who were um, hoping to have extra date or a different date available, and they were very kind and have moved them. So that will be on our calendar, and we'll put more on social media going forward. Um, thank you all, and we'll see you in just about a month. Bye. Thank you, Bye. Thank Bye. you everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Linda. <laughs> Thank you, Aaron. Thank you.